Jesse die? Yeah, he was a player with an airplane. Ah. Uh, okay, so let's go ahead and get started. We have a couple topics here. Today's topic especially was on how to name organic molecules. And the basics of the naming are going to be the same throughout the next six chapters. What's going to change each six chapter is for different types of molecules, we have slight variations on those rules. And so it's very important that you master the rules in chapter 19 because they're the same rules in chapter 20, 22, 23, 24, and 25. So if you don't learn them in chapter 19, well, that's about a quarter or a third of the tests that you're going to, you know, screw up on. And it's a third of the t next test and a third of the following test. And so this is one of those things that, you know, if I had to pick one of the top three topics for this first six chapters, this is it. This is probably the number one thing. Number two is probably going to be reactions, and number three will probably be uh, how intermolecular forces and all of that interact with each other. So uh, make sure you not only listen to today's lecture, try the homework, but also make sure you're doing this on and off too. And what you'll find is that the, I would say a majority of the molecules, like 75% follow the rules really well, meaning you don't even have to think very hard hopefully after a while. And then the other 25%, uh, you know, you always have to remember whether something should be num numbered with the lowest number, alphabetical, you have to remember the extra little rules that we throw on. But focus on sort of the basic rules right now. Alkanes are probably the simplest molecules to name. Everything after that gets harder. So this is where you should master it instead of trying to learn all the other harder rules and these rules at the same time. So the basics for naming we already kind of covered at the tail end of yesterday's lecture. And that's that we have the number of carbons is used frequently. So does anyone remember one carbon was? Two carbons is? Three carbons is? Wow, oh, someone is either looking or has got this down. <laughs> so meth, eth, probe, but, pent, heck, oops. Ugh. What happened to my pen? Don't mess up on the computer. Hex, hepta, octa, nona, and deca. Now, we can go longer than 10 carbons. There's rules for it. But in this class, we pretty much limit ourselves to 10 carbons and under. When we get to the biological molecules, what we'll find is that even though we could name them using the rules that we're developing now, uh, we tend to use their common names when they get really, really large because their real chemical names are a mouthful to say and very complicated. And the rules that we're using are called IUPAC, which stands for International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. So IUPAC. So when you see on the homeworks that you're using the IUPAC naming rules, that's all it really means is it's just a set of rules that have been published and then were updated about 20 years ago or 15 years ago, and that's what everyone uses. Now, the, f the difficult part about the naming rules for some of this is there's certainly the very first set of IUPAC rules. That's what your book follows. Then about 20 years ago, they updated some of the naming rules for certain types of compounds, and your book didn't follow that. So if you search things on the web, you might find some molecules that don't quite follow the naming rules. Now the changes are usually minor, and usually once you learn the old rules, the minor changes for the new rules kind of make sense and aren't going to confuse you too much. And then of course, you also have to get over the fact that quite often people misname the molecules, or we go with their common names, or sometimes there's some old pre-IUPAC naming rules that some people still use or some things still use. So if you go out and you're looking through the web, you have to be a little careful and realize that sometimes things are not going to be named 100% correctly. Now usually you can figure out what the name is and what the molecule should be, but occasionally it might be a little confusing. But we will stick to 
in this class, the pure IUPAC rules from the first set of naming rules and not worry about all the modifications that have been made. So, the IUPAC rules, the first thing we always have to do is identify the longest chain. Continuous carbon chain. And sometimes this is called the parent chain. Or I like to call it the main chain. And so if you have a nice simple molecule like this, the main chain is just literally the molecule. We can number it, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six. And so that means this is hex. And so that hex is telling us that there's six carbons. And then we throw on an ending like A and E. This is telling us what functional group there is. And in the case of alkanes, in the case of things that just have carbon-carbon single bonds, that functional group is really just saying, I only have carbon-carbon single bonds. And then those last three letters change depending upon what we're talking about. If there's a double bond in it, we call it an ENE. -E. If there's a triple bond in it, there's a YNE. -E. You guys have seen some molecules with an OH group in it, right? Those are, then we replace that with an OL at the end, so that would be like hexanol. And so depending upon what functional group is in that molecule, that ending on changes a lot. And so one of the things we have to be really careful of when we're naming molecules is spelling counts. The difference between hexane and hexene is two different molecules. And it even gets down to the point where a single letter will make a difference when we're naming these molecules. So we have to be really careful. Okay, the other thing that we have to be careful of when finding that longest chain, oops, maybe we just do it this way. <sighs> My computer rebooted this morning and updated, which probably means it's going to screw up or something. We'll see how it's working. So, for instance, if I draw a molecule like this, where's the longest chain actually in this molecule? Hmm? Yeah, there's three different spots we can start at. We could either start here, here, or here. So we have to have some rules to differentiate that. Our first rule says find the longest chain. And so notice that the longest chain starts there and ends here because that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Whereas if I start and end at that other end, it's one, two, three, four, five, six, or one, two, three, four, five, six. So notice that we have to sometimes figure out which chain is the longest one. Then we have to decide which end and number from. So our general rule is we want to have the side chains. Sometimes they're called daughter chains. Has to have the lowest number. And so if I take a look at this, if I start here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, or oh, every time I click below that yellow line, it's going to be annoying, isn't it, and slow my computer down. All I want to do is change the color. Or if I number like this, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Notice that in this case, both numbering systems have that side chain on the number 4, right? And so in this case, does it matter which end of the molecule we start from? No. And so what we do is we break this into two parts. We sort of have that main chain, which is heptane, right, because it's seven carbons, that's what the hept means, and the A and E means that it just has carbon-carbon single bonds, and then we have this side chain over here, so this is what we call our side chain, and how many carbons does that have? Two. 
two, so that means it's f, right? And if it's a side chain, we call it yl. So that means that it's two carbons, and the yl part means that it's a side chain. And so we also need to put a location, and so we're going to call that 4-ethyl, meaning it's off of the fourth carbon. And so this is 4-ethyl heptane is the real name for that molecule. And so each part of that name has significance. This tells us the location of the side chain. This tells us the length. This tells us that it's a side chain. This tells us the length of the main chain. And the A and E tells me that the only thing I've got in this, car in this molecule are carbon-carbon single bonds. You guys with me so far? That's because it's on the number four carbon. So for instance, yeah, we'll show you another example that illustrates this better or illustrates it again. We'll have lots and lots and lots of examples in this lecture. Four ethyl. So the idea is that we're always finding the longest chain, and then we have to identify those side chains. Because it's got two carbons. So remember that meth eth pro part is our counting. The ending parts, the YLs and the A and E's, and we'll learn a whole lot more endings, are telling us sort of what it is. And probably someone can convert that to nouns and pronouns and verbs and adverbs, but I don't know any of that English crap, so we'll skip the not do that. No, the heptane part is just the main chain. Yeah, but why do you have to put carbon from the end of the floor? Where do I have a 10 anywhere on this page? This? It says this right here. It says loc. L O C. Location. What did you think it meant? 10 C? No, I just put it lock. <laughs> Means location. It's an abbreviation, but we know that Jay likes to do that. What's the end of slideshow? What do I only have two? S oh, I must have somehow. Oh, I see. So. No. Because I'd have to go back like 30 slides. Except, where is the beginning of my slideshow? Go to slide. Oh, I was on slide two. So somehow I skipped from slide one to 30. <laughs> oh, well, we'll chalk it up to it being, uh, well, it's not Monday, unfortunately, Wednesday. So the reason we need a location, for instance, is if we compare that molecule versus, say, that molecule here. So how many carbons are in the main chain? Five. So that means this is going to be a pentane, right? And it's the same for both. That's the whole idea behind this. Oops, pent, A-N-E. And then for the side chain, the difference is where it's located, right? Now. We do have to remember that we can number from either end of the molecule. So remember, we always want to give that side chain the smallest possible number. So also remember, every time there's a tiebreaker, every time there's two different ways you can do something in the molecule, or the name, there's always a tiebreaker. So if you could number it like this, one, two, three, four, five, or you could number it backwards, one, two, three, four, and five for those carbons, we have to have a tiebreaker for that, right? And the tiebreaker says, give that side chain the smallest possible number. So we're going to call that a 2-methyl. 
And then, of course, on the other one, notice it doesn't matter where I start counting from. It's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and this is a 3-methyl. And so we've got 2-methylpentane. And we've got 3-methylpentane. So every time you have a side chain, you have to tell me where it is. You can't just say it's methyl something. Now, there are some exceptions to those rules. If the location is obvious, meaning it isn't, uh, there's no doubt in mind. For instance, like in this molecule right here, since it's a side chain, this has to be methyl propane. You'll find that sometimes they put that 2-methylpropane on there, and sometimes they just call it methylpropane because there's only one spot that methyl group can be on, right? And so sometimes you'll find that they leave that off. I try to usually put it on, but I am pretty flexible, and I can't remember which way I programmed the computer to do it. Aaron. Yep. So the 3 is telling me that location part. So remember, this is a location, not 10C. This is a length of a side chain. This is the length of the main chain. And the A and E part is just telling us that we only have carbon-carbon single bonds, that there's nothing else exciting about the molecule. So every part of the name has a corresponding purpose or function. You guys with me so far or not? Okay, we have to have some more tiebreakers, but we have to introduce one more new rule. For instance, if I have this molecule right here, so if I have multiple side chains, then we give the number of side chains is equal to things like di, tri, tetra, penta. And I got to be honest, I don't think we even have an example of what uh, on the computer where we have a penta, where we have five side chains. We might. And so if I sort of number that one, two, three, four, five, then that is two, two. Notice that's two locations for two groups, right? Dimethyl. Pentane. So this is telling me again the locations. This is telling me I have two groups. This is telling me that they're one carbon long. The YL is telling me that it's a side chain. The pent is telling me that it's the main chain length is five carbons. And the A and E is simply telling me that everything is a carbon carbon single bond. So every part of a molecule has a specific purpose, or every part of the name. The only way to be really good at this is to practice. It's just kind of like when we're naming ionic molecules and molecular compounds and things like that. Practice, practice, practice. And I've got so much practice on the internet that I don't think you can run out of molecules. It's possible, but I doubt it. One person once asked me, can you give me a list of all the molecules so I can memorize them? So I printed off 20 pages of paper. Good luck, right? You can't memorize all the answers to these questions. What you have to do is learn the rules and learn how to apply them. And the only way to know that you know how to do that is to practice applying them. Because I've got to tell the location of both side chains. Because, for instance, they don't have to be on the same carbon, right? So, carbon is really contained, For carbon carbon single bonds. When we get into our next functional group, which is the next chapter, carbon carbon double bonds, then it'll be an E N E ending. And there's a couple other things to talk about too, but for now, just A N E means carbon carbon. Well, 
the rule is that if it's a side chain, it's a YL ending. And then meth tells me that there's one carbon. And so if I look at it, if I kind of put dots on the main chain, there's five carbons, right? And then each of the side chains is only one carbon long, and so that means it's a meth. No, because it's already counted on the main chain. So if I look at this next molecule, should I start numbering from the left or the right? Because notice that it gives me some differences, right? If I start numbering this way, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, versus 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, notice that in this numbering scheme, my side chains are on carbons 3 and 4. But in this numbering scheme, my, carbon, my side chains are on carbons 2 and 3. So the tiebreaker is we number the main chain, or when there's a tie, make the lowest numbers. And so in this case, this would be 2, 3 dimethyl pentane. So these have to be the smallest, po or the first number has to be the smallest possible number. So remember, every time there's more than one way to do something, there's a rule that says which way we should do it. So that when we have a name a molecule, there should be one unique name for every molecule, even though you could probably call it 3,4-dimethylpentane, and if someone drew it, they'd draw the same molecule. Why is it that because there's two? Because there's two. So this is kind of pairing up with that set of numbers. So it's because there's two mm -hmm. Here, we'll do another one. We, we, we'll do lots and lots of examples. See, there's lots of side chains now, right? So I'm not trying very hard to make the main chain tricky, so I'm just going to put dots on it. Notice that there are six carbons in that, so that means our molecule is going to be a hexane, right? And then what we do have to start thinking about is should I name it from the left side of that molecule or the right side of that molecule? Well, if I do it from the left side, then notice that I get side chains of 2, 2, 4, and 5. And if I number it from the other way, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, I get 2, 3, 5, 5. So do I want the top numbering method or the bottom numbering method? Top. Now they both start with 2, right? But the next number then is a 2 in the top one, so that's best. And so for the top one, we're going to call that 2, 2, 4, 5. And now I have four groups, so what is that? Tetramethylhexane. So remember, every part of this name means something. You can't forget or get any of those parts mixed up. The nice thing about the computer is the computer is 100% anal retentive in that it will not give you the right name if you make any sort of mistake whatsoever. If you have an extra space in there, it won't let you get it right. If you miss one number, one comma, one dash, one anything, it will not give you the right answer. And I'm not going to say that every molecule I've typed in there is 100% correct, because I've had students uh, work studies and various people input molecules in there. However, uh, it's been kind of gone through over the last, say, three or four years pretty heavily, so there probably isn't that many mistakes. What I say is that if you think there's something wrong, go ahead and screenshot it. Either screenshot it on the computer or just use your phone, since you guys all have good phones. Anything, but I mean, 
generally the website, since your homework you could actually bring to me, right? Okay, what if I have something like this? Let's see. Now notice that there's two chains that I can make with six carbons. I can go like this, one, two, three, four, five, six, or let's switch colors. Why is this so slow? Or, you know, for instance, I could make my side chain like this, you know, with the red dots. Maybe I should just draw two pictures. That might make life easier, too. I don't know. Which set, which, which way is better? They're both six. What? Right, so there's got to be a tiebreaker, right? Meaning every time there's something that you have a choice of, then there's a tiebreaker that says which way to make it right. Well, don't say top and bottom. How about red and blue? Yeah, so the red, notice, has two side chains, right? And the blue only has one side chain. So we want to maximize the number of side chains. Or I have another rule for that. Because we don't do it very often. We never have side chains. There's no, let me actually put it this way, there's no side chains on side chains. Now, there can be. Certainly, we can draw molecules that we would have to name in which there's a side chain on top of a side chain. We're just not going to do it in this class because I've got to be honest, it's pretty easy to draw molecules that are very difficult to name. Or I won't say impossible to name. I'm not even, you know, there's mo I can draw molecules that I don't know how to name without looking up the rules sometimes. And so it is possible to do that. And so we're going to avoid doing that, okay, in this class. Well, I won't give you any examples that have double side chains is what I'm saying. So if you come up with, so, so let's, let's name this twice. Let's name this how we're supposed to, which is considering this is our main chain. And this will make it maybe more obvious. So that's the same molecule, right? And which end should I start numbering from, left or right? Yeah, this will give me my smallest set of numbers. And then notice that this one is a 2-methyl, right? This is a 3-ethyl, right? Now, which one do I put first when I name it? No, that would be logical. See, this is what pisses me off about some of the naming rules. That would make perfect sense. I love that answer. That's a great answer. Nope. If we have a, we go alphabetically list the side chains. So you have to know your alphabet. This was the one that, if I make a mistake, this is usually where I make the mistake. So we're going to call this 3-ethyl-2-methyl um, hexane. And so we don't order the side chains by the numbers. We order it by the alphabetization. That's what we're going to get to next. So we showed you the right name, right? Now I'll show you the problem you're going to run into if you try to name it sort of in the blue method. Well, come on, just click on that, switch to blue. So if I draw that molecule one more time, and I'll we'll put this off to the side. If I number it this way, one, two, three, four, five, six. What type of side chain is that? It's three carbons, right? But the tricky part is it's not attached at the end, it's attached in the middle. 
And so what, what it really is is here's one, a side chain, and then this is a side chain on top of the other side chain. There are ways to name it. There's non-IUPAC ways that your book shows. They call that an isopropyl group, but we don't do that, okay? That's one of the things I decided. It breaks the IUPAC rules, and it's just not worth doing. So we should, if you have to name a side chain on a side chain, so the, if you tried to name it that way, it would have to be something like 2-methylpropyl, meaning notice, oops, that's a methylpropyl. So notice I've got a side chain on top of the side chain, right? And we're not going to do that. So you'll never see that except for one example in one spot in the naming. There's only one spot it will ever happen. Otherwise, we'll exclude it. And even then, we don't see it very often. And that's why, for instance, I say it's very possible to draw molecules that get very quickly hard to name. Because once you put side chains on side chains, or imagine a side chain on a side chain on a side chain, it can get ugly really fast. So you can actually do it, it's just like We're not going to do it. Okay. Meaning, every molecule I'll give you should have, like, for instance, in this case, we really should go with the most branched chain. Meaning, even if you did name this as a side chain with a side chain, it's wrong because you can draw it as a branch or as a, the most branched chain. Realize, and I haven't, we haven't talked about isomers and things like that, but if you even look at molecules with just under 20 compounds, there's hundreds of thousands of molecules. And so, even with 20 carbons, it gets ridiculous. And then when we start talking about biological molecules that can have hundreds or thousands, boy, you would never name it this way anyway. So really, organic naming rules apply to mostly small molecules that we'll be using frequently. And then when we get to the really big molecules, we have other rules for thinking about things like that. What? Yes. I mean, you can, like I said, you can name even the biggest protein with the IUPAC rules. The name might be, I think that someone said that the longest word in the dictionary or that, that has ever been printed or something like that is some guy named a protein or a pep, you know, something like that, gave the actual IUPAC chemical name. It's like 90,000 words or something stupid like that. Yeah. That's just your teacher being silly. Okay, let's see. How about this? So I'm going to give you a hint. This is the longest chain. No matter which way I number from it, the side chains are going to have the same numbers. So which way do I number it, left or right? Yeah, I'm going to name it this way because that gives me a 3-ethyl-4-methyl hexane. Whereas, and I'll switch colors, assuming I can find the little mouse pointer. That's the hardest part of this lecture. If I number it the opposite way in red, I get a 4-ethyl-3-methyl hexane. And that's wrong because we want the, if there's a tie, the smallest number with or alphabetically. Like I said, there's always a tie. Now, I got to be honest, for probably, like I said, 75% or more of the molecules, it's going to be pretty straightforward. You're not going to have to go very deep in the naming rules and things like that. If you kind of remember that you always want the longest chain, and we'll summarize these at the end. Make sure I'm not skipping one example. I would tend to do that sometimes. Yeah, I think that's it.
So if we kind of summarize these rules, and then we'll just do a bunch of examples to finish off the class period, I think. So my general rules are find the longest chain. And it has to be continuous carbon atoms. Now, for now, that rule sounds a little silly to say continuous carbon atoms, right? But remember, eventually we're going we're gonna to work in oxygen and nitro nitrogen into these molecules, in which case we don't count those as part of the chain. But for now, I like to put that word in there just so it's in the back of your mind, but we don't use it, right? So long as continuous carbon atoms, and it has to be the most branched. Or what that's really saying is that there's no side chains on side chains. So once you've identified your longest chain, now you have to number the chain. And here, the functional group always gets the smallest number. Now, in this case, again, we haven't used that rule yet because the only thing we've talked about is carbon-carbon single bonds. We haven't even thrown a double bond or a triple bond or an alcohol group or anything else on there. So again, we're not even using that rule yet, but I want it in your brain and sort of in your background, okay? Oops. And then we number so that overall we have the smallest set of numbers. And what I would do is maybe go back through your notes and for each one of these rules, kind of draw an arrow showing one example that will help you remember the difference between the two. This is something that you have to make your own. I can list the rules, I can go through examples, but until you sit down with a piece of paper in front of you and try to do this, you don't know where you're going to start to make your mistakes, if you make any. Maybe you could be perfect. I don't know. I can hope. Now, we order, or so, actually, let's do it this way. The first tiebreaker is numbers. The second tiebreaker is alphabetical. And then I kind of ran out of room, so we'll just kind of go over here. What I generally recommend, and I should also point out that there, this is a process. It's just like doing math in you know, kindergarten. At first, they made you show all the steps, right? And then as you get more and more familiar with the steps, you can start to skip things, right? You know, if I did 4 times 20, I know that that's 80 in my head. I could, you know, write out 4 times 20 and, you know, show all the steps. So when you guys first start naming things, you might want to show all the steps. And then as you get more and more proficient with naming, you can show less and less steps. So for the side, so I usually like to list the side chains. And also remember to include the di, tri, tet tetra part, and so on. Now, I haven't shown you how to do everything. We're going to, you know, this is the basic set of rules, and now I'm going to show you a few other things that should kind of make sense. And there's really only two things to show you that'll kind of maybe throw you for a loop. And I'm even going to tell you the first one, halogens. If I have a halogen in a compound, for instance, chlorine is chloro, fluorine is fluoro, what do you think bromine is? And who wants to go out on a limb and guess iodine? Iota. Yeah. So we can have fluorines, chlorines, bromines, and iodines as side chains in a molecule. And they just have, instead of a YL ending, they just get called fluoro, chloro, bromo, and iodo. So 
you know, if I have something like this where I just throw a chlorine on a molecule, that's just two chloro butane. Otherwise, they follow all the regular rules of any other side chain. They just happen to be halogens instead of carbon atoms. Meaning, they follow the rules like alphabetically. Like, for instance, if this is a methyl and that's a chloral, I would name this 2 chloro 3 methyl butane. Notice this one I count 1, 2, 3, 4. This one I count 1, 2, 3, 4. And I number it that way because chloro comes before methyl, right? And so in that case, 2 chloro alphabetically is before 3 methyl. So we have the 2 going with the chloro. Throw a tricky one at you. Actually, let's just do it this way. Which way do I start numbering from? Well, if I number the F, this would be 2 and a 4 and a 4, right? But if I number it this way, that's 2, 2, and 4 for the location. So remember, lowest set of numbers. But when I write it, I'm going to call it 4-fluoro-2-3. dash dimethyl Ugh. Sometimes those names get ridiculously long. So notice that the numbers, this gives the smallest numbers. But alphabetically, fluoro is before meth. So that's why we say for fluoro. And I know, to me, if I make mistakes, a lot of times I want to put the dimethyl first because D comes before F, right? But we count it based on the methyl part, not the di tri part. Don't ask me why. Sometimes the rules are somewhat arbitrary. And the reason that the rules are occasionally arbitrary to a little extent or aren't necessarily the ones I might pick is probably because for some more complicated method of naming or for some more complicated molecules, you have to make the rule that special way that we don't want to count it, order them based on the dyes and tries and stuff. Instead, we want to order it on the methyls and ethyls and propyls and stuff. So that's one set. The other, well, let's see, maybe I should say, before I say just there's only one other thing, I should probably um, double check. Yeah, how about the other thing that can be interesting, oops, I want to go to the next slide. Go down a slide. Ugh. Don't mess with me, computer. What if I have something like this where my molecule actually bends back on itself? So it makes a circle. We're going to call that cyclo, for instance, since there's four carbons, butane. We don't see these that much, but they do crop up now and then. Or if I make this lovely looking house molecule, what do I call that? Cyclo. Yep, if it circles back on itself, it's cyclo. And then we have to be careful with the cyclos. For instance, if I just throw a methyl group on that, that's just methyl cyclobutane. We don't actually have to put a number on it because there's only one, because all the spots are the same, right? That's exactly the same as if I drew that molecule with it there, right? Which is exactly the same if I drew it pointing down, which is exactly the same as if I put it on the fourth corner, which honestly is exactly the same if I decided to draw the molecule to look more like a diamond. Meaning there's a lot of ways you can draw these molecules. There's only one name, methylcyclobutane. Those are all the same. 
And in this case, because all the spots are the same on the carbon, I don't have to number it. Now, if you called that one methyl cyclobutane, it's wrong technically. It's not the worst mistake in the world to make though, right? Because for instance, if I do have something like this, here I really have to do, do have to say one, two, dime, oopsie, dimethyl cyclobutane because I can also have, for instance, something like this, which is 1,3-dimethyl cyclobutane. I would have to say that whether you should include numbers or not, or the very few cases where you, shouldn't, where you don't need to include numbers, that's probably one of those spots that gets people, you know, that that's a frequent mistake. So in general, you're better off including the number than not including the number. But look at it, the molecule occasionally and say, okay, I do or don't need to include a number. So Aaron. Is well, yeah, you have to choose either one, two, three, four, or notice that if I do the opposite, it's still the same, right? Now, you bring up a good point. We'll show you another example where it does matter, right? What if I have Which way should I go around? Where should I start? There's three different spots I could start, right? Now, I could go one, two, three, four, five, in which case I've got one, two, five, right? Or if we pick another color, the other way to do it is one, two, three, four, five, six, in which case I've got one, two, so which one's better? One, two, four. Yeah, so we need to call that one, two, four, trimethyl cyclohexane. I have to be honest, I've thrown a lot of rules at you, and until you go and sit and practice them and make mistakes, you will never really learn this material. I can't imagine thinking, oh, okay, I did the homework and I'm going to wait two weeks and take the test and think I'm going to cram all these naming rules into my head, especially when you've got to cram all sorts of other information on your head. This is truly the core. If you have to spend a large amount of time on any single topic in this class, this is probably the best bang for the buck. Because if you get it, then the next five chapters worth of naming starts off being pretty easy. If you never get this, the next five chapters are a nightmare for you. And they'll probably be a nightmare anyway for some of you. I'm trying to remember what was chasing me in my dreams last night. It was very strange. I feel like I ran a marathon, kind of. Probably students with cleavers or something. Okay, the other thing we haven't really talked about is what if I have a name and I want to draw a picture? And the reason I don't generally spend as much time on that is because it's usually 10 times easier. So for instance, if I have the molecule 2, 3, 4, trimethyl dash 3 propyl Octane. Oops. Ah, don't mess with me, computer. Don't lock up. Don't do it. You know you want to be nice. <sighs> Maybe we don't want to do an example. So that'd be silly, right? Jeez. Well, looks like we're going to have to kill it. Hopefully. Smooth view, huh? Someday I'm going to, uh, you know, be able to edit out all the pauses in our things like this where we kind of 
you know, have breaks and small talks. And I don't know, has anyone got anything interesting going on this week? Do you guys have any cool activities planned as students? Wah, wah, wah. Oh. Oh, there's yesterday's notes. I forgot to delete off again. Okay, so what we had said is what did we have? I forgot. I might make a slightly different example. What was it? Two, three, four? So two, three, four. Trimethyl dash three. Actually, let's make that four propyl octane. So Honestly, the way I draw my molecules is I draw them backwards, meaning you want to start by drawing octane before you draw a 2, 3, 4 trimethyl. So octane is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. And then you literally just start drawing the functional groups. This says 4 propyl, so 1, 2, 3, 4. Propyl is how many carbons? 1, 2, 3. And then it says there's a methyl on 2, 3, and 4. So we really do it backwards. We start here, and then we add the side chains. And I have to be honest, I tend to draw my molecules from left to right. It just seems to make the most sense that that's how we write and that's generally how we count things and things like that. But, you know, I can draw the exact same molecule at 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and go 1, 2, 3, 4 and put the methyl groups here. I can, heck, even draw it up and down 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 and put all the methyl groups like that. So I can draw it upside down, right side up, inside out, however I want. But let's be honest, if everyone numbers it from left to right and kind of does it the same, then life's pretty easy for everyone. If you want to be a pain in my side when you go to draw these molecules, draw them upside down and reverse and things like that. It makes my job grading them harder. So you can just be kind of a little pain in the ass if you want to do it that way. That being said, might not be worth your time. It really won't cause me that much pain in my life. Yeah, you can do that. Yeah, you can turn your homework upside down, and then you can try reading the molecules upside down. That's always a bonus. So going from a name to a molecule generally is a lot easier. I want to point out some other common mistakes. So little mistakes that people make. Oops. And we'll come back to this too. But for instance, is it possible to have one methyl um, butane? So see, if I try to draw that, there's butane, right? Here's my methyl group. What is that really? really just pentane. So for instance, you can never have a 1-methyl. Now that's not entirely true. There are ways that you can have a 1-methyl in a molecule. But for now, it's very true. Just like you can't really have a 2-ethyl group because it automatically becomes part of the longest chain. And so I have to be honest, when you're, making, when you're going from a name to a picture, like if I'm making stuff up off the top of my head, I have to be very careful. I almost have to draw a mental picture of the molecule I want to practice naming or drawing and write the name and do it. It's much easier to just draw a molecule and name it. Although, like I said, if you're just randomly drawing stuff, it's also very easy to draw a molecule that you just don't have the rules to name. Like, have we learned how to name a molecule that has two cyclic parts? No. Or have we learned to name a molecule that has a cyclic part and 
more than one, a side chain on a side chain or anything like that. I mean, it's very easy to just go, okay, what's the name of this? I don't know. That's not very easy to name because, you know, this is the main part of the molecule and here's part of a side chain and then the side chain has got some side chains on the side chain and so that's ugly. Even though I can draw that molecule pretty easily, I got to be honest, I would give myself about a 50-50 chance of getting it right at the moment. Meaning I think I remember the rules, but it's been a long time since I've tried to name anything ugly. I try to be very careful and only stick to the things that you guys are allowed to name. Okay, we're going to call it quits here. Well, because if, for instance, I said that I have, say, 2-ethyl hexane. So here's my hexane, right? Five, six. And here's my ethyl, right? Well, that's actually one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is really 3-methyl peptane. Meaning you can't have a 2-ethyl group because it actually means it's part of the longest chain in general. Like I said, there's some ways around it. You can get tricky. And once we have more functional groups, it gets a little bit not like that. But the idea is that you really can't have things on the end. So what do we got going on for the rest of the week? Today's, we got Thursday, Friday. On Thursday, on Thursday we're going to have a lab safety quiz. On Friday, we're going to have homework 19, B, and C due. Uh, darn it, I forgot to print myself off a copy. I'm pretty sure that's right. Um, here's my answer keys. On Thursday, we're just going to finish up lab and answer questions. So if you guys kind of have the lab already done or you work hard to get that done, and don't have any questions, then you can just come in and take the safety quiz. But if you want to sit and practice drawing condensed molecules and get help on that, if you want help on doing the naming homework tomorrow during lab is an excellent time to ask those questions. Uh, yeah, that's about it for me. Suggest so if you want to go get a stapler, you can, or, you can, or I'll remember to do it. I don't care. Oh, and we also all wish Jasmine good luck on her basketball games, right? <laughs>